All right, first part of this question asks us to write an expression for f prime and use it to find the relative maximum and minimum uh, values for f in terms of p. Uh, now, it's going to be in terms of p because we're not given a constant right here, so do everything that you know how to do to find the derivative of f first. So we can find our critical points where we can find our relative maximum and our minimum values. Now, whenever you see that word values in calculus, you've got to think y values. Whenever you see values, it always is normally referring to the y values. Show analysis that leads to your conclusion. In short, show your work. So, uh, the first thing we got to do is take the derivative. So, f prime of x is going to give us 3x squared minus 12x. Um, and then the p goes away because he's constant, so you don't have to worry about him anymore. Now we've got to take this uh, derivative and set them equal to 0. That's how we find our critical points. Uh, we have 3x times x minus 4, and that equals 0. So we're going to get x equals 0 and positive 4. We get that by taking each of these and using the 0 properties, setting each of these factors equal to 0. Now these, 0 and 4, are our critical uh, like locations. All right, At these locations, that's where we're going to find our, um, our relative maximum and minimums. So what we're going to do next is to find the values, like I said, remember these are y values, we're going to take the 0 and the 4 and plug them into this. Remember, it's going to be in terms of p, so that's okay that there's a p there because uh, it, our answer is going to be in terms of p. So if we plug in 0 to f, we get, um, well, it would be 0 to the third minus 6, 0 squared plus p, our answer would be p. Okay, so this is one of our values. And then for the other... Uh, other critical point is uh, 4 raised to the third power minus 6, 4 raised to the second plus p. And when we do that, um, let's say we'll get uh, 64 minus and then 6 times 16, that will give us 96 plus p. A little more simplifying would give us negative 32 plus p. So these are two values in terms of p. Those are our first answers, our answers to a. B says, for what values of the constant P does F, that's this function, have three distinct roots? How does one function have three distinct roots? Here, check this out. If um, you think about this, it has a degree of three. So uh, that means our function is going to look something like this. Okay, this is our F function. Let's say F of X, this guy. All right, so... How would this have three distinct roots? Well, if my x-axis was right there, it would only have one root. If my axis was right there, if that was my x-axis, then I would have one, two, three roots. Now remember this, our um, two points are, our relative um, maximum value is going to be p, and this one right here is going to be negative 32 plus p. And that just makes sense, because that's like p minus 32, that's going to be the lower value. That's going to be the upper value. So what values of P would make um, this one have three roots? So that I would have a root right here, right here, and right here. Well, the lowest that this can go, I mean, if I put that down uh, farther, uh, if I, like let's say P equals 0, then if P equals 0, then we would have this. Boom, up like that. And so right here, p would equal 0. So I don't know what the x value would be. It'd be like x. Actually, I know what the x value is. It's right here. Ah, so actually, I should draw my y-axis right here. And my y-axis shouldn't be over there. All right. Sorry. Just a little more exact. OK, so that is 0, comma 0. So that's when p equals 0. That's the p. And this right here would be 4, comma, right? 4 is our other x value there. So 4, comma. Uh, negative 32, because if p was 0, then our value would be negative 32. So when it's 0, then we actually only have two distinct roots, one right there, one right there. So it has to be greater than 0. If we go greater than 0, if p is greater than 0, then our graph would move up. And then we would have, if we move our graph up, then we would have three distinct roots. And then, uh, when, you know, as p goes up and up and up, when p finally gets up to 32, that's when this point right here will be right on the x-axis. So this would have to be less than 32. Uh, that's going to be our answer for 
uh, for B. And the last one says, find the value of P such that the average value of F over the closed interval that is 1. Okay, so to find this, um, what we're going to do is we're going to find um, the sum of all the Y values between negative 1 and 2. And the reason why we're going to do that is um, we want to find the average Y value. I mean, because it says... Um, find the value of P such that the average value of F, that's the Y value, average value of F, the value of F is the Y value, or the closed interval is 1. So um, <clears throat> we're going to take the interval of our function, which is X squared, or X, sorry, X to the third minus 6X squared plus P uh, DX. Okay, we're going to take this. This will give us the sum of all the Y values. This adds... The, the interval adds together all the y values uh, between negative 1 and 2. And then we're going to divide this by the interval. And the reason why we do that is, I mean, whenever you find an average, you, you find a sum and then you divide it by the number of numbers that you're adding together to get your sum. And so here our sum is this. This will give us the sum of the y values. Then we have to divide it by the interval. And so um, you've probably seen it written like this, 1 over, just to find our interval, we would go negative 1 minus 2, um, or you would say 2 minus negative 1. It doesn't really matter. I mean, it does have to be positive. Uh, so then ultimately we're going to be dividing this whole thing by 3, and you don't need to write this anymore. So the 3 is our interval from uh, negative 1 to 2. Alright, now let me move some things around here so we actually have some space. Okay, now I'll do this. I'm going to actually ignore the dividing by 3 for now. Uh, and then we're, going, we're just going to find the interval. You know, we're going to integrate this. Okay, so we have to take the antiderivative of this function. And so that's going to give me... Oops. It's going to give me... Uh, let's see, that's going to be uh, x to the 4th divided by 4. And then we're going to have... That would be x to the third divided by 3. So that would just give me a 2, x to the third, 2, x to the third. And then we have the p. That would be p times x. Now remember, p is just a constant. So like if that was a 5, this would be 5x. That's going to be px. And we're going to integrate that from negative 1 to 2. So the first thing we do is we plug in the 2, which would be 2 raised to the fourth power divided by 4 minus 2 times 2 raised to the third plus p times 2 and then we're going to take that and we're going to subtract what we get when we plug in negative 1 to all the x's so we're going to have let's see that's negative 1 raised to the fourth divided by 4 and then we have negative 2 times negative 1 raised to the third power plus actually we'll say minus 1 times p and so we got to subtract that whole thing um, let's go ahead and simplify stuff. We have 16 divided by 4. That's not right. 16 divided by 4. This would be 16 right here. <coughs> here, so we get 4. Oh, excuse me. And then 2 to raise to the third power is 8. 8 times 2 is 16. We have negative 16, so minus 16 plus 2p. Now we're going to subtract. I don't need parentheses around that right now. Uh, I'm going to subtract this, so this is going to be a positive 1, because negative 1 raised to the 4 is positive 1, that's 1 fourth, and then we get a negative 1 there, and a negative 2 times negative 1 will be a positive 2 minus p. So I'm going to distribute this negative right there now, and that's why I saved that negative. Now I don't need those parentheses anymore. I would have to combine uh, the 4, the negative 16, uh, the negative 1 fourth, and a negative 2. So let's see, let's, um, let's combine all the negatives first. So we have 4, and then we have the negative 16, and negative 2 would be negative 18 plus a negative 1 fourth. So it would be negative 18, 1 fourth, and in our p's we have 3p. This will simplify us down to, let's see, we'll take away 4 from the 18. That will give us negative 14, 1 fourth, plus 3p. All right, now this, what we just found, is not our answer. That is the integral. Remember, the, that's the sum of all of those y values, and, but it's in terms of p, and that's okay. Next, we're supposed to divide it by the interval. 
you know, from since we're going from negative 1 to 2, we divide this by 3, and we get our final answer. Now, instead of dividing by 3, let's um, actually multiply it by 1 third, because that's actually easier to think about. Uh, now, this, as an improper fraction, is going to be 56 plus the 1, plus the 1, so we get negative 57 over 4. If I multiply it by 3, that's going to be negative uh, 57 over 12, and then I multiply the 1 over 3 times the 3p, and I just get p. All right, so this right here is um, the average value of f, but we want to see what the value of p is when it equals 1. So we have um, this equal to 1. So I'm going to add 57 over 12 to both sides, so I get p equals 1, actually this would be 12 over 12, plus 57 over 12. That's going to be 6, uh, what was that, 8, 9, 69 over 12. And so we divide 69 over 12, divide 69 by 12, um, we approximately get, I mean I don't like approximate numbers, let's do exact. We get 23 over 4. Uh, that's because we divide uh, the top and the bottom by 3. And then uh, that's what we get, 23 over 4. Okay, and that's um, that's the value of P. That'll give you the, the average the average uh, value of f. Oh, that's a uh, that's a pretty crazy qu question right there to try to get you to use the the integral to find the average value. You, I mean, it could say average area instead of average value. It'd be the same idea.